Today I'm going to show you my build process for this Babinga cabinet. But first, I want to thank today's sponsor, and that's Acme Tools. They offer a wide selection of tools and equipment for woodworkers, do-it-yourselfers, and contractors from all the major manufacturers. For more information, check them out at acmetools.com or click the link in the description below. This cabinet was made using four large slabs that measure 19, 20, 21, and 22 inches wide. The fourth board hadn't been purchased yet, but trust me, it's just as wide. The boards were over 11 feet long, and I've been sitting on them for over a year waiting for the perfect project. I figured this cabinet, since it's going in my home, would be the perfect opportunity. To break the boards down, I used my jigsaw and a lot of brute force, but I first started by making a few reference marks to make sure that I got the most out of these four boards. Next, I used the table saw to cut the boards close to their final width, and then I head over to the joiner and planer combo to take them down to the final thickness. Since it's literally been three months since I've released a YouTube video, you may notice a different clamp rack set up right there, and those are the woodpecker clamp rackets. They save a whole lot of room. If you're interested in hearing me talk about them, I've got a second YouTube channel. Make sure that you're subscribed. I'll link to that below. The side panels required a glue up since they're 15 inches wide at the base. I put glue on the edges and then clamped them up and let them sit for a few hours. Out of the clamps, I cut the boards to width and then to length using the crosscut sled. For the longer side panels, I use my track saw. Now we're at the part of the video where I show you how to make these super amazing sliding dovetail grooves on the side panels. But there's one little problem. I accidentally deleted the footage off of the SD card before copying it off. It's a mistake that you don't want to have happen. And after 75 or so build videos here on YouTube, it's finally happened. I've learned from that mistake. I've got a new process going forward on copying media off before I format them. So hopefully this won't happen again. To cut the female portion of the dovetail, I like to use two routers. You could just use one router, but it's gonna require you to change a couple of bits. The first router is a trim router, and I've got a quarter inch spiral bit, and it's set to a depth of three eighths of an inch. This router is going to remove a majority of the waste so that your dovetail bit doesn't have to work as hard. The second router is a plunge router, and it's got a dovetail bit in it. And this is going to be set at three eighths of an inch as well. Now, let's talk about the jig that I have. If you've seen a video on my channel, I've created a little jig. It's for a zero clearance dado jig. This is pretty much the same thing just for sliding dovetails. As you can see, it's got a groove right here that is the exact location and size and depth and everything of the sliding dovetail bit. On this side, it's kind of hard to see, but I've got a little mark that is the center of the width of this dovetail groove. Now this is a one inch spacer, and that's so that I can place it here and then run the trim router through here, and it's going to be centered on this groove. So that way I only have one jig, and then when I'm done with this quarter inch groove, pull this out, pop this out, and now this is going to still be the zero clearance for the dovetail bit. Now we can make a sample mark on the board and test the jig. And I'm also going to make a stop mark to show you what it's like to do a stopped cut. Next I'm going to bring this line down just so it's a little bit easier to line up with my center line on the jig. Take this, got a center line, and just line it up and it's perfect. And to hold the shim in place so it doesn't move, I'm just going to use a piece of double sided tape. I set the depth of the bit to a quarter inch and then make the pass to remove the waste. I don't go the full three eighths with the spiral bit. Next I remove the shim and then I set the depth of the router bit to three eighths of an inch and then make the pass. And there's your sliding dovetail. I've got plenty of scrap pieces around so I will, uh, I'll show you how to make the male portion over at the router table. I've got the same dovetail bit in the router and I've got the height set to the same three eighths of an inch. I've got a majority of the bit buried into the fence and you're going to want to do a couple passes and keep adjusting the fence back until you get that fit just right. And the kind of fit that you're wanting is a snug fit, but not one where you need to use a mallet. And that is what I would consider a perfect, perfect fit. Now when it comes time to gluing this in, I'm not gonna be using PVA glue because it's gonna cause this to swell. So I'm gonna be using tight bond hide glue and it's gonna lubricate the joint because if you put regular wood glue on there, it's gonna be a nightmare to get that in. And these panels are 30 inches wide and 12 to 15 inches deep. So 
that is the kind of fit that I'm looking for. And just keep micro adjusting that fence and you'll dial it in just perfect. The case sides feature a curve that starts a little over halfway up and reduces the width from 15 inches to 11 inches. I remove the waste using my jigsaw and then I pop the flush trim it in the router to remove the rest of the waste and give me the perfect curve. Before gluing up the case, I took the opportunity to sand everything up to 400 grit and then hand plane the faces and edges of all the components. This is easier to do now while the panels are easier to deal with. The top of the side panels feature a one inch taper and that's cut using the track saw. This little element just adds to the overall design of the case and helps get rid of that square vibe it had. One final design element before pre-finishing the case was to add a light chamfer to the front and top edges of the side panels. Next, I applied three coats of a wiping varnish, sanding in between the coats with 400 grit sandpaper. With a project this large, it's always easier to pre-finish while you have access to both sides of the panels. Before I assembled the case, I drilled for the adjustable shelf pin sleeves using a template that I made on the CNC machine. The brass shelf pin sleeves I used are installed using a two-part epoxy. I wanted to use nicer hardware on this project, so I went this route. Ah, the glue up. I used tight bond high glue for the glue up to make this go as painless as possible. Regular PVA glue, like I mentioned earlier, will cause the dovetails to swell, which would make this task a bear. As you can see, it wasn't that bad. A majority of this task was made easier by propping the case sides up with clamps to hold everything into place. The next day I started working on the stock for the doors. I milled the pieces to 3 quarters of an inch thick and cut them to width and length. Next I clamped the pieces together and then make a few reference marks for the domino joinery. The rails get a wider slot to allow the styles to move just a little in case my lines were off. The styles, however, get a normal size slot. Next, I used a router table to cut a groove on the inside edge for the glass panels. The rails get a stopped groove that I chiseled square once the doors were glued up. I used soft close hinges on the cabinet, and to drill for those, I used my handy Craig jig. You've seen this jig multiple times on this channel, and it's a fantastic tool for this task. I used my Rockler template for hole placement in the cabinet to drill for the hinge brackets and the doors were done for now. For the feet, I collaborated with Chris Haley from Studio CSH as he's a very talented turner. Chris has a YouTube channel where he plans to share videos of his work. I'll leave a link below to Chris's YouTube channel as well as a link to his Instagram page and his website. Give Chris a follow and I hope you enjoyed this segment.
With the feet in the shop, I start working on the base. I cut the pieces to size, cut the joinery, and now I'm cutting the gentle curve using the bandsaw. I take the pieces over to the router table and using an awesome flush trim bit, remove the waste. I assembled the base in two steps. First, I glued the side aprons to the legs, and then once the glue dried, I clamped up the larger aprons to the two side components. The cabinet features two drawers that are joined together using half-blind dovetails. To cut the dovetails, I used a couple of shortcuts to save some time. The first shortcut was cutting the tails using a jig I made on the bandsaw. I'm working on a dedicated video to show you how to make this simple jig and to go over the entire process that should be released next week, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Next I remove the waste using a chisel and then I transfer my tails to the pin board. To remove the half blind socket waste, I start by using an eighth inch spiral bit to remove the waste. I stay about a sixteenth of an inch away from my scribe lines, and then after each pass, I keep lowering the bit until all of the waste has been removed. Next, I use a chisel to remove the remainder of the waste and going all the way back to my scribe line. The rear panel of the drawer is joined using a sliding dovetail. I used the same exact method for this joinery as I did on the case, so it was pretty simple. Again, I used high glue for the drawer glue up, and since I used a dovetail joint for the rear panel, it locked everything in place and no clamps were needed. I cut a notch in the drawer bottom to allow it to expand and contract during the seasonal changes. To hold it in place, I installed it using a screw. The back panel of the cabinet is made up of two quarter inch veneered panels. I start the panels by breaking down a full sheet of plywood using my track saw and my TSO guide rail square. This is the first time I had used the TSO GRS-16 and it's a game changer for me. Not only is it more accurate, but it's so much faster not having to make multiple marks, line up the track and then make the cut. All I have to do now is make a single mark and then the guide rail square make sure that your track is 90 degrees to the reference edge. With the panels cut to size, I spread glue over the surface for the veneered panels. On one side of the panel, I'm using a quarter sawn bobinga veneer, and for the backer veneer, I'm actually using curly walnut. And I know, it's curly walnut, but it was the cheapest veneer I could buy, so I used it. I've got plenty left over to use on other projects, however. I stuck the veneered panel in the press, and I left it in there for about an hour before taking it out and letting it set overnight. The cabinet is complete, so now I apply the finish to the rest of the pieces. I again wiped on four coats of varnish, sanding in between each coat with 400 grit sandpaper. And I can't forget to apply the varnish to the brass knobs. I had these custom made and I actually sent off a piece of the same babinga to have inlaid. To attach the base to the cabinet, I installed figure eight fasteners. I drilled the holes using a Forstner bit in the aprons of the base and then I pre-drilled and installed the screws. Next up is the back panels. I slid them into place, pre-drilled and installed brass screws. The screws were installed into the edge of the top, bottom and middle panels. To install the glass panel in the doors, I put a bead of RTV silicone around the inside edge of the groove and then placed the glass in the door. After about an hour, I put the backer strips in place and then I shot a few pin nails to hold them. However, if I ever break a piece of glass, this will allow me to remove the backer strips just in case I need to replace that panel. And finally, we can drill for the hardware just using a quarter inch brad point bit. It took me over five weeks of nights and weekends, but the cabinet is finished and in the house. And what can I say, I absolutely love the design and especially dig the babinga. With an oil finish, the color just popped and it looks beautiful. 
I want to again thank Chris Haley for collaborating with me on the feat. Don't forget to check his channel out and his website as well. Thanks to Acme Tools for making this video possible by sponsoring this channel. Check him out at acmetools.com and also don't forget to leave me a comment below letting me know what you think of the cabinet. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already and hit the like button if you like the video. And don't forget to click the link below to go to my second YouTube channel where I've got a bunch of offcuts type videos. Uh, where I talk about all kinds of stuff. So click the link below and subscribe to the second YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next build video.